everybody has a gun uh welcome to the crawford family forum welcome to everybody who's looking at us online and listening uh my name is kevin ferguson i'm the producer and reporter for off ramp uh we're the weekend show on kpcc southern california public radio uh i've reported on food i've reported on families and like a lot of you guys here i eat which is why we're here to talk about it we're here to talk about uh family food traditions, what your mom cooked, what your dad cooked, what your grandma cooked, what you cooked, and why that's important to you. And we have a great selection of guests right now. Uh, so I guess we'll get started down the line. If you guys can introduce yourselves, say what you do, a little bit about what's some of your favorite family. Actually, we'll get to that later. Who you are, what you do, a little bit about your biography. Uh, hi, my name is Jen Harris. I'm a staff writer with the LA Times food section. Uh, I also cover uh, stuff for fashion, too, and calendar entertainment stuff. Uh, and I'm also a co-host of a radio show called um, Fork and Amazing on T-Radio V. This is my co-host right here, Dominic Riley. Uh, and every week we talk to chefs around town, um, mixologists about what's happening in the LA food scene. I'm Dominic Riley. I am also a host of Fork and Amazing um, with Jen Harris. I am also brand, or excuse me, director of brand engagement for American Gonzo. Food Corporation, which is a boutique restaurant group, has three restaurants currently, and I do their social um, and digital branding. I'm Terry Wall. Is my microphone working? It's working, Terry. Okay, good. And I want their two jobs. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want to do for a living. No, I, I, I'm a chef and a restaurant owner. I own Auntie M's Kitchen in Eagle Rock. And um, that's about all I do. <laughs> 24-7. That's more than that. That's pretty. You make really good cupcakes. That's a lot. That's, That's a, a lot. lot of stuff. That's, That's a lot of stuff. Job. Uh, um, my name is Win Tran. I am. Um, I'm Asian. Uh, that means <laughs> irrelevant. I know. I. Uh, I'm a, <laughs> I own a restaurant called Star Kitchen that I started illegally at my apartment five years ago. So this mom's dish stuff is incredibly relevant because I didn't know anything else but what my mom cooked. So, that's it. I'm Brisiana, Mexican. <laughs> uh, and I, along with my family, run Gela Gets a Restaurant in Koreatown. I hope some of you have visited. Um, and yeah, that's it. I own a restaurant in Gela Gets a. I love mole.com. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to just turn over my mic. Hold on. Uh, so when we first started talking about this topic, I figured a good way to. Um, get the conversation going, and we got this on our radio too, was to talk to some KPCC notable names about what their favorite dishes their mom or dad made. And I figured we could start with playing just a little bit of that. It's about three minutes long. Uh, is that ready to go? Yeah, let's take a listen to that right now, and then we'll get the conversation going. Free to dance, yeah. Hi, I'm Larry Mantle. Well, let me just first say about my mother, the most amazing thing when it came to food is she could have a house full of people come over for dinner. She's out entertaining the people, having a full-on conversation, and somehow the dinner would get done with her just popping in every now and again to the kitchen. I don't, and it would be great. I don't quite know how she did it. She's just totally connected with people as she makes things. My favorite dish that she makes actually originated with her second husband, my stepfather, and it's a chicken piccata that is just absolutely great. It's wonderful flavor to it. And when I go to her house for a birthday dinner, that's almost always my choice. Chicken piccata, a pesto pasta that she makes that's just terrific, and, and that's my favorite thing. I'm Wendy Lee, business reporter at KPCC. I don't know, I mean, well, my mom was a stay-at-home mom, so every every night it was a home-cooked meal. To me, I mean, even though it wasn't a special occasion, to me, anytime she made lumpia, that was a totally special occasion. I could smell uh, the smell of lumpia sizzling in on the stove, and the smell of pork would kind of waft through the air, and I would be working on my homework in my room, and I'd be like, is that lumpia? And I would run over to the kitchen, and I'd be like, lumpia, lumpia, and my mom would be like, cooking it, and she'd be like, no, don't touch that one because that one's hot. And so she would leave one aside for me so I could eat before dinner. My name's Adrian Florido. I cover community health at KPCC. I think probably one of my favorite food memories is of my mom heating up the tortillas in the kitchen. Um, while my dad was sitting at the, at the dining room table, she would be standing at the stove 
um, over the comal, which is this flat um, griddle that most Mexican families use to heat up tortillas. And they'd get really hot, and so uh, she wouldn't want to hold them in her hand for too long, so she'd just fling them uh, across the kitchen, across the dining room, to my dad like a frisbee who would catch them uh, and set them on his plate and eat them. Did that ever go wrong? Did it ever like land on his face and end up scalding him or something? Not, not, not that I remember. But I, I just remember it being a really funny scene to kind of always watch, you know, because you would just see this this mass of corn dough flying across the room. Hi, I'm Alex Cohen. When it comes to favorite dishes growing up, I can't say that any of them actually came from my mother. I love my mom dearly. She's very talented in many ways. Cooking is not one of them. Uh, she and my dad actually made an agreement when they got married. Uh, she would take care of the cleaning. She'd do most of the child rearing, but it was really up to my dad to cook. He is and was a fabulous cook. My mom, not so much. Uh, her one dish was scrambled eggs, which she never could manage to pull off without getting shells of them, which we still joke about to this day. Day. But she did actually once when I was in college, I got mono, a really terrible case of it. My tonsils swelled up so big I could barely swallow and she made eggplant lasagna, which she then proceeded to put in a blender so I could drink it out of a straw. And as disgusting as it sounds, it was actually really good at the time. So. It's really sweet. Yeah, eggplant parmesan in a blender. I'm sure that made you guys hungry. Um, so, I guess we'll get started with, uh, I'm curious about what the audience thinks of, um, or I'm curious to know what, like, in the audience, your guys' food traditions were. Um, by a show of hands, how many people here had their mom as, like, the principal cook in their home? It's a pretty good number. It's a lot of people. What about your dad? <laughs> Fewer people. What about uh, somebody else entirely? Grandma, uh, aunts? Yeah, that, that, that was me too for the most part. Um, so I guess we'll talk to our panelists now. Uh, what, um, what was cooking like in your household? Who's, whose job was it? Uh, I guess we'll start with Jen right here. Uh, my mom, who's in the audience today. Hi, mom. Um, she, she cooked primarily. My dad was on the grill. He could, he could barbecue things, but that was about it. Uh, but my mom, though, and she had a challenge, or she has a challenge currently, because my dad doesn't like flavor of any kind. <laughs> he thinks cumin is the devil. So he, um, he's, he's a salt and pepper guy. So she kind of had, had to um, work with his very bland palate, but also make something good that the rest of us would like. So she would do, my, one of my favorite things is her pork chops, which are really amazing. Just um, thin cut pork chop that she would coat in a mixture of spices, and not too many, um, and cornflake crumbs, um, and serve it with applesauce. And it was, it's amazing, um, but primarily my mom cooked in the family, so. My dad did some cooking, but he was, like he and my grandma, who I, I ate a lot from, um, they were of the meat should be gray uh, school of thought, like co constantly well done. I, I never saw like a, a pink piece of steak until I was at a, like a restaurant and I was old enough to like order meat to whatever done this I want. I was like, oh, that's how it's supposed to taste. That's my dad. <laughs> <laughs> that's my dad too, yeah. Dominic, what about you? Um, so my, I, I remember both of my parents cooking. My dad took the reins though and cooked um, mostly every night. But the funny thing is to be on a panel where it's mom's best dish, it was easy to remember what her best dishes were because there weren't that many. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not a negative thing. It's not that they weren't good. It's just I can remember them because they were you know, few and far between my dad's many dishes. Uh, so for the dish, and the funny thing is that a lot of the dishes that my mom did make, though, I find myself recreating often. Um, I like her meatloaf. I made that maybe about a month or so ago. Uh, her tacos I like. Uh, I, she used, uh, used to make fried rice, which is really good, and it's more American fried rice, and I try to make it a little more Asian these days, but um, it's... What, what's, what, how is it an American fried rice? American fried rice, I mean, there is soy sauce, which I guess makes it Asian, but there was... Um, <laughs> <laughs> she would use... It was just... Um, it would be beef or chicken. She would put bacon, which I don't see in many fried rices. I like and, that. Um, <laughs> just scrambled egg and green onions and brown the rice in a wok, so... Um, and I make that all the time, and, it, and for some reason, like as easy and simple as it sounds, it's hard to make taste just like that. And maybe it's the wok and the, the many years of, of using the same wok, but yeah. Terry, what about you? Well, uh, my mother immigrated over here from Judenberg, 
uh, when she was four years old with my grandmother and my grandfather. And so they, my grandmother and my mother cooked German food our whole lives growing up. Like, that's all we knew. And my favorite dish that my mom made were crepes. And she used to put them in this chicken soup. So she'd roll the crepes up after she made them and then cut them like noodles, like really thin like noodles. And she'd put them into the chicken soup uh, sort of like it was a noodle. And it's just the best thing in the whole wide world. Like the chicken broth was made, you know, for two days and it was amazing. And then for dessert, we'd have the same uh, crepes with a little bit of butter in the middle and then uh, folded, uh, sort of rolled, and then squeezed with lemon and powdered sugar. Oh my gosh, it was so good. Delicious. Uh, all right, I'm, I'm hungry now. Uh, <laughs> oh, Wynn, what about you? Oh, wait, I'm trying to figure out how to do this crepe noodle thing. That sounds <laughs> really interesting. Um, you know, it's funny. I, I know I joked around about how I'm Asian, but when I was a kid, I was very vehemently against eating Asian food because, you, know, you know, I'm a diaspora child. My parents left Vietnam when they were 16, 17 years old. So growing up, I didn't know whether I was American or Vietnamese, you know, or Asian. And I had, I had to deal with that a lot. Um, so, you know... I ate a lot of hamburgers and hot dogs, much to the chagrin of my parents, but one dish that my mom did make, which every Vietnamese kid knows in, around the world, and actually the basis of why we started our illegal and underground restaurant, is this, it, it, Vietnamese is called tit ca, and you can use like pork shoulder or, you know, or pork butt or like pork belly, and it's made with dark soy sauce and light soy sauce and brown sugar, and it's just braised overnight, and you put eggs in it too, so then the eggs like absorb all the flavor in it, and served over rice, and it's just amazing. It's so good in your mouth. <laughs> but, it, and, but it's really savory, and that's the thing. Like, it's, it's, it's super comforting, right? It's, it's not fancy. Um, it's pretty simple. You put all the ingredients in a pot, and you stew it, and then when, you're, when it's done, you just put over a bed of rice, and you eat it, and that's it. So When I wasn't eating hamburgers and hot dogs. <laughs> uh, Bricia, what about you? Oh, man. I was a very spoiled child because growing up in Mexico, my mom was a stay-at-home mom. So she would cook breakfast and dinner every single day from scratch. And I don't remember like having one bad meal in my life that my mom cooked. So trying to figure out what my best mom dish was, I, I still don't know what it is. I honestly, my mom is like the kind of woman that, like people will come over and they would be like, like my 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 uh, my aunts would come over a lot. My uh, my dad's sisters, so they'd come over just to surprise us. My mom would go into the kitchen, open the fridge, and she would just make like a five course meal. I don't know to this day how she does that. Like, I'm like, there's nothing on the fridge. How do you like? She she'll she'll come over at my house. She'll open. Up, she's like, oh, well, you can make this, 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 and that. I'm like, what? How, wait, what? So my mom just. I don't know, she's like superwoman. She's not here, she's in Mexico. But um, if she's watching or she's listening, mom, I love you, I can't wait to, for you to come home and cook again. And I mean, I, it's really hard for me to say like one particular dish that she made. Um, I have an array, my brother's in the audience. He's, raise your hand. He's single ladies, just so you know. <laughs> and um, one at a time, one at a time. So, um, it, it, in, in, I mean, it, it, we were just talking about it. They were like, well, what do you think, like, mom's best dishes? And all of us, like, when we get together with my sisters and my brother, we can't really come up with one great dish. I mean, her mole, which is what our um, uh, specialty is at the restaurant, is the best mole I've ever had in my life, and nothing will ever come close to it. So I'd have to just say the mole based on all the work she puts into it. But my mom can just make like a sunny side up egg or over medium or over easy. And it would just be the most amazing egg in the world. She just knows how to make everything taste so good. I, my mom is like the best cook in the world. <laughs> I think, uh, were there ever like any like special projects that she'd be doing? Like you, you, she'd start cooking something in the morning and you're like, mm -hmm. oh man. That's going to be mole. That's going to be great later on. Um, it was usually when I would get home from school. My sister um, and I would walk home from school, so we'd get home like around 4, and we'd have 
you know, we'd eat later on. Um, and she would always be mopping when we got home for some reason. I mean, my mom was like really like homemaker. So we would always get home and she would always be mopping. She would finishing, she would always be finishing mopping the floor and we'd walk into the room and on our way from like the entrance to the room and we had a very small house. So the whole house would get filled up with anything she was cooking. So it was in like in the morning, it was mostly, it was really when we got home from school that it would just smell like, oh my gosh, she's gonna make this today. And she would have like a different agua fresca every single day too. Oh I don't know, gosh. I'm telling you, man. I know, I know, ah. I know. That's not fair. I know, I feel bad for my brother's wife, you know, whoever marries him, cause you know, he's just used to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I know, but she'd have like a different, it, it would whether it be cantaloupe or watermelon or hibiscus or tamarind, she would have a different agua fresca every single day. And to this day, she every, when she comes when she comes to visit and we go visit her at her home, she'll ha she'll just like do an agua fresca in like five minutes. And I'm like, what? Where? How did she? She's just like a magician, just like whoosh, a dish. <laughs> um, I growing up. Um, I, I, my mom's here, Ra raise your hand, mom. Uh, my mom was a single mom, she worked retail, she worked really late hours, she didn't get to cook a lot. Uh, I would, I think one of my favorite things that she made involved most of the work being done in the morning, she would make a pot roast in a crock pot, and I could smell that when I came home from school, and it smelled great, I don't know what she put in it, but it was always something that I really looked forward to, it would keep for days and days. Um, for my grandma, she um, she had this one thing where she would make fresh noodles um, from scratch. She would make pasta from scratch. She would start in the morning making the noodles. I could tell that she was we were going to have them later on. This would only be a weekend thing. And she would serve it with this like uh, kind of gravy that she would um, get from making this like kind of roast in the oven. Now this is from the gray meat school of cooking. So this roast would be a brick. It would be gray, it would be tough, and you would, and all of the flavor that was in that pot roast like somehow fell out of it into the sauce. <laughs> and the, the sauce was amazing. And you would just eat through the, uh, the gray meat brick to looking forward to the noodles and that was, one of my best memories still, even though the meat was disgusting. <laughs> and I, and she, she didn't have a recipe for it. She didn't have anything. And I, I've, I've heard that from a lot of people that like a lot of grandmas, a lot of moms, they just don't have recipes. I never asked her how she made it because she could never tell me. Um, I've, the closest thing I've found to what she does when I'm trying to cook is like a really slow cooked ragu with fresh pasta. Like it's kind of the closest it comes, but she was like, Irish Catholic. I don't think she'd ever eaten a ragu in her life. <laughs> um, so I guess one of my first questions is like, how, how did recipes get passed down to you guys? D did they at all? Like, were they real written down recipes? Were they people just telling you like, oh, you know, when the sauce needs a little bit of salt, just go ahead and put in a tablespoon. What, what was that like? Anybody who feels like... Um, but one of the things that my grandmother and my mom were really good at making also was apple strudel. And I remember being a kid and my grandmother laying this tablecloth over the table, over the kitchen table, and her just throwing the flour onto the tablecloth, making a well inside of it, cracking eggs in it, you know, and, uh, and just making it without a bowl, without anything, just her hands. And that's how the whole apple strudel would go. There is nothing measured, and it was just all like by feel uh, and by taste and all of that. And so when we got older, my mom was like, well, you know, we really need to get this recipe because None of us, you know, know how to make it without grandma because we'd always make it with my grandmother. And she didn't have a recipe for it. So a friend of mine took photographs of her making it step by step. And the photographs came out lovely, but still to this day, <laughs> we can't make it. We can't make it. It's gone. It's done. 
What, what would she say when you asked her for the recipe? Just, oh, just a little bit of that and a little bit of this. Yeah, exactly. And she, it, well, she couldn't understand how we didn't get it. She's like, no, you can't, you can't, you feel it? It needs a little bit more egg. It's like, uh, okay. You know, and it's just the kneading. And she's like, you know, you can't over knead the dough. And, you know, you need to see the specks of butter and this and that and the other thing. And she just could not get how we didn't see that. So, okay, I could, um, so my grandma's the same way, actually. I did a story, I wrote about her and a couple of her... Um, recipes that she makes for Christmas a couple years ago. And so we have a test kitchen at work um, that tests all the recipes that need to run in the paper. So we actually needed this recipe to be on point exact measurements. So I went over to her house and I'd asked her a couple times, how do you make this dish? It's a sweet rice dish. It's a sticky rice that's typically made. It has a uh, lapjang, a uh, Chinese sausage in it, green onion, uh, garlic, a lot um, dried shrimp, a lot of fun stuff in there. So I go over to her house and I'm like, okay, grandma, how do you make this? And she's like, you know, you just, you cut this and you put it in the wok and, and, and you know, you cook the rice. And I was like, so I was like, okay, you cook the rice. Turns out she, she rinses it, then she pours boiling water over it, then she puts in the pot, then she puts ta a couple tablespoons of chicken broth at a time. I was like, this is the most complicated dish I've ever, <laughs> I was like, this is like risotto and fried rice. And you, so, you just cook the rice. Exactly, but I was like, no, you don't just cook the rice. So I literally had to sit there and when she would do something, I was like, stop. So she, she'd have like a handful of garlic and I was like, stop. And then I took out like a measuring spoon and I was literally trying to measure things out of her hand because she could not tell me. Wow. And to, I mean, and so we, the, and then the test kitchen was making it after I got them the recipe. Um, and um, they made it six times before I said it was acceptable. Because it just, it, and even then it's like, it was right, but it wasn't grandma's rice. So, but anyway. I, Where would she get her ingredients? She, from the Chinese market, the Asian, she's Chinese from the Asian market. She's in Monterey Park. Yeah. And so does she always go to the same market for? She goes to the same couple markets, yeah. yeah. Um, but she, she's just very, um, not particular about things. But then you have my mom, who's a big baker, um, so all of her recipes are written down. Um, and they're in this big folder in our kitchen that also has a bunch of takeout menus mixed in with it. Um, but, but no, she's very meticulous, and I like to bake with her, because then she'll be like, no, well, you know, it's a little less than a cup. I was like, well, what does that mean? She's like, just run your finger over it and kind of put it a little off, so, but yeah. My, I, my wife got a cookbook from uh, her grandma and the only reason why she was able to get recipes was because she and her bridge club decided to publish a recipe book to like oh. benefit some charity. She was kind of a socialite. And so we have like this like local bridge club cookbook. And the problem is that we can't tell whose recipes are whose. Mm -hmm. Just like look at them and because it's just they didn't put any names to it. It was just a list of like, you know, one lady submitted her aspic recipe. And well, that wasn't grandma, but we could figure <laughs> out which ones were from her just by looking at what she cooked and what my wife remembered. Um, anyone else, any, like, I'm sure your mom well, had yeah. very detailed recipes for all yeah. this stuff. You here. know, my mom actually does keep recipes. Really? Like, she does, actually does have, like, she's got, like, a, maybe, like, a sack, like, those notebooks between recipe books and magazines and her own, like, notebooks, and they always have to be the same notebook, like, the same size, just different color like a specific notebook she needs. Um, but when, um, cause when she's here, we usually cook together and I like to learn her recipes and um, like I'm trying to re rewrite hers and try like same thing with you. Like, okay, hold on mom, yeah. let me just measure that real quick and let's see. Um, but her recipes consist of just ingredients and not of measurements and or she'll say like, Una pizca, which means like just like a like a tad bit of something, or just like a hint of something. And I'm like, what does a hint of mean to you? You know? So um, pre it's pretty much similar to Jen. Like that's really how my mom is. But she does. She's always kept. Or, or when she was in the kitchen, she would like try to get fancy sometimes when we were younger. So um, she would write down like, oh, I really like the way my chicken came out today. So she'd try to remember what she put in there, um, and she'd write down the ingredients, but not quantity. So um, when she comes, we try to like, we try to cook together and try to figure out to get to the right point. But somehow, when I make the dish, it doesn't taste the same as when she makes it. And I swear, like, I've seen it. Like, I'm like, okay. And, and I try to watch every single thing she does. 
Um, and she'll try to sneak in some something here and there, right? Like purposefully, so I don't know like that one thing she puts in there. So I've learned to really watch her. But e I mean, I watch her to like really, like to the last thing she puts on. Like wait, 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 wait. You know, even like a little water or little things that she'll use the same. Like she won't wash the blender because she wants to put the same thing in the blender and other ingredients to mix all the flavors together. Um, but it's my my. But it's really just hard to get to the to that exact point that she always, because her dishes always taste the same. So it's just, I don't know, I think it's just a gift. What gave you the idea to open up your place? Uh, well, you know, it's a family run business. So it's my, we started with my mom and my dad. Oh, they, oh, they yeah. did start it. Mm -hmm. Oh, awesome. <laughs> what, what so, was so the mole recipe is there. Yeah, that yeah. one is there. <laughs> that one always tastes the same, guys, when you go. Wh which one is it? Because I think you guys have a few moles, right? We have six in the menu. Um, my mom knows how to make eight different ones, though, uh, but we only have six in the menu. Order we have menu a black. Huh? Can you order off-menu moles there? No, no, no. And when she's there, like, she'll make something for us, but those two that are not on the menu are just extremely hard to make, so we don't. Uh, but we have, like, like, the black one isn't hard enough to make, right? Um, we have the black, the red, a coloradito, um, an estofado, which... She makes different ways. Like she makes a tongue estofado that I always ask her to make on my birthday, and I try to make that. It just doesn't taste the same <laughs> when I make it. <laughs> Mine tastes better. Um, and then we have a green and a and a and a yellow. So those are the six moles that we have. Are those recipes anywhere for people to find? Does she give away a little bit of a secret? Yeah, I have her. I have her mole recipes, and uh, we'll, you, you know we work together every time. And like the tongue is so far, though, I have her in down. And um, I wanted to actually share that with you guys, but I looked through like our notes, and I was like, wow, I really have to remake this like three times before I feel confident in sharing it with somebody to make it at home. Because there's some there's some moles that are easy to make at home, like the green, the yellow, the estofado. But the red and the coloradito and the black, you need to like get certain chiles and you need to roast them and then you need to grind them and then you need to blend them and then you need to smoke them. So those are get really like those get those are harder to make. But and then you add water. That's and then you add, and then you add a tad of water <laughs> and then so those to get hard those get those get a little like but the green and the yellow and the estofado are in my mom. Oh, it's just easy. Oh, it's one, two, three. Oh, it's really it's. It's fussy. Like she'll be like, "Well, easy to you, mom, but you three know, you can make Three and a half hours anything. later. Yeah, three and a half hours later. You know, she's like, "Oh no," and um, I tend to oversalt things when I cook all the time, so um, she's very critical with me too when when I when I when I when I when I cook when we cook together, and nothing's ever going enough for her when I when I cook. She's like, "Oh, it's good, but you know." <laughs> what's what's the deal with chocolate and mole? And is it in every mole? It's the is entire it in deal. What do you mean? What's <laughs> the deal? It is the deal. You just summarized it. You got it. <laughs> like, you got what, the deal. What's the deal? Well, the three. It is the three. Um, the black and the red and the coloradito. Those three have chocolate inside. So um, is it an unsweetened chocolate? No, it's sweet. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. It's the perfect like. It's the perfect blend of sweet and savory and spicy. And you should come to get like it's at 3101. Oh, I'm coming. 3014 West Olympic. Nice plug. Nice plug. <laughs> no, I'm coming. I love mullet.com. That's really good. So, um, you know, and I'm curious to ask you about this because the menu at Starry Kitchen, at least like from what I've seen of it, isn't super, super traditional looking. It's not stuff I've seen before at no. other restaurants. How have those, but the traditions that were in your, parents' house must have informed your cooking, right? Well, you know, because it's me and my wife. My wife's actually the executive chef, but, you know, I'm kind of the palate. Um, it, when we started, the idea was we would make, so we say we make pan-Asian comfort food. It's all about comfort food that, in Asian homes that you don't necessarily eat in restaurants, and that's how we started. And even then, like, a lot of the dishes that, so you looked at our menu, a lot of those dishes actually are, like, comfort food dishes in most of those cultures, yeah. but people aren't familiar with and aren't as common, like, you know, the, the dish that we're most well known for at the restaurant is a Singaporean chili crab. Um, it's really unique. There's only like eight places in the entire country that make it. Um, and it takes a long time to make, because it takes us like two days to make the sauce alone. Um, but it actually is like a, it's, you know, if you go to Singapore, every stand has it. Every hawker stand has the Singaporean chili crab. You can get it everywhere. But I mean, it's, I don't know, it's, for us, and especially for me, it's, you know, when you go eat, it's not necessarily about, you know, it has to be the best meal in the world. It just has to make you feel good. And that's, that's kind of like the basis of everything we do. Like, you know, it's, 
it just, you know, it, it, you know it, certain smells and certain tastes remind you of certain memories as a child. And that's kind of, you know, the focus of what we do. Um, I don't know, like, otherwise we just have fun too. I mean, it's a combination of that and trying to take, you know, classic flavors and just having fun with it and turning it around. I mean, we honestly don't have really many rules. I mean, even being Asian, it doesn't always have to be Asian because it's our restaurant, we can do whatever we want. Um, I usually put an F-bomb in there, but I took it out for you guys. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we were told not to cuss. I know, but I can say ass, I can say ass. Oh. Sorry, sorry, I, I, had, I had to, you I'm better sorry. better say it then. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. A lot of people aren't laughing right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, what about uh, the rest of you guys? When you cook at home, maybe if you don't, if you're not professional cooks, has have those traditions come through in your own cooking at all? Well, I um, I think in the past three to four years, I kind of ventured into cooking. I I learned from just watching my dad, and I don't remember. I remember having. I'm sure other people remember there was this big. It was a card catalog, and there was um, you know rices and pastas, grains and salads, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. roasts and meats, and that's where I, I would find myself sometimes just going through those catalogs, looking at you know at what those dishes were, and kind of dreaming about making them because they seemed so grand and deluxe. Um, but I don't I don't ever really remember seeing my dad using them, um, and I and I I and I know he learned to cook from my grandma. And her recipes are passed down to his sister, and through phone calls, I think they share recipes too. But um, because because there was no recipe books, and because things are kind of passed down through phone, it seems like everything is a secret. And so I've taken that into the way I cook, is where everything I make is kind of a secret. I don't I don't really tell people, and I and I <laughs> and I don't share. <laughs> You're perpetuating this cycle. Like this, this is. Some people would say this is part of the problem. Yeah, I mean, you're and, gonna be 90 years old, and your kids are gonna like try to like pry recipes from you. Yes, and and I and I just don't give secrets, or I'll tell you how to make it, but I leave out like one important thing that makes it my own. Oh my god, you are uh, totally that guy. Yeah, I I do that, and and I'm and I'm just gonna live that down. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but what got me interested in cooking was just watching both my parents uh, cook, and. And, and just, I don't know, something about creating something yourself and tasting it and having people love it. I love, I love what you get from, from others when they taste your food. We heard about the Baconated Fried Rice from your mom. Yes. What, would, uh, what would your dad make? Um, pretty, much, pretty much everything. I think when, I'd say, when I, I don't remember much as a kid like being anything creative, but as I got older, I noticed him experimenting with herbs. Like he went through this phase of rosemary. He got a rosemary bush, and everything had rosemary in it. Like, and I went through this phase where I hated rosemary because I can smell it, and it just takes me back to like these pasta dishes where it was really just pasta and rosemary. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I just lost my train of thought. But um, I don't know. What's your question? Like, what? what? <laughs> okay, so your dad made a lot of pasta with rosemary. What oh, were some so of the what, good things he made? Um, I think of I. You know what? I, I'm glad you brought this up. Uh, things that now are really, really popular. It was those those cuts of meat that that were really inexpensive and now are, are, are not like oxtails. I remember being a kid having oxtail stew and I would tell people about that at school and no one knew what oxtails were, oxtail stew was. So I would stop sharing because I couldn't, no one would, would be able to relate. My mom makes a killer oxtail. Like, it's oh my God. beautiful, right? What does yeah. your mom not do? I know, <laughs> I know. And now you see oxtail um, sauces and these all these things built on marrow and that was like so cheap back in the day and now it's like really expensive even like cuts of pork um, think of like I don't know pig's feet and things like yeah, that it's just pork butt just yeah all these feet. all these cuts of meat that were inexpensive the and cheap, yeah the cheap cuts of meat always had the most right. flavor yeah there was like that's yeah. where all the fat was yep. and all and once you break down all of Sinew that stuff yeah that, it, it oh, really yeah, like lent itself to, to flavor so I just so I think that's kind of what I remember is just those dishes that people didn't know about, and now everybody knows about them and everyone's curious. Do you cook from recipes, actual recipes, or do you just kind of do your thing as you go along? Well, what how I got started was in college. I would watch, um, embarrassingly enough, I'd watch a lot of Rachel Ray because that's not embarrassing. That's cute. Because what you learn from Rachel Ray is is what she what I thought she taught well was. What flavors go with certain things? Like what spices go with pork? What spices right. go with chicken? What spices go with lamb? Um, how to make salads with using different ingredients? And so I kind of 
learned from visual. And I just like think of the I think of those spices and I think of those flavors and I just throw them together and see what sticks and it's just trial and error, trial and error. So there's no recipe, but right. I, I will like cheat and Google but you stuff know what goes to kind of like see what goes together. Right. Like right. I, I have an idea of like the list of ingredients and then I Google it to see like oh yeah I got the, got all those <laughs> or like I forgot that one. You I know got that right. I got that <laughs> um, right. <laughs> and that's really from just eating, eating yeah. and watching. Yeah. It was more of that than yeah than. Um, than re, you know, reading a, a recipe. Can I yeah. mention something to that though? It's because you're back on the previous topic. It's my my mom, like their moms, you know, in Vietnamese, it's it's a verbal history. Like it was passed down. You learned it by watching all that. But it's strange because the advent of the Food Network and accessibility of recipes, my mom's memory for food is different now. Like she didn't ha used to have recipes. Now she goes all by recipes, but changed her cooking completely too. Mm -hmm. And I'm not not to say it's better, but she doesn't make the same dishes she used to when I was a kid. Like, she doesn't know how to make them anymore. It's kind of strange. It's kind of changed wow. everything. Like, you know, when she was a kid in Vietnam, and, like, she literally left Vietnam. She was 16 during that two weeks of, um, you know, at the end of the Vietnam War, she left. She jumped on a boat and left. And that's how she learned about Vietnamese food. And, but since then, like, that memory is kind of all dissipated. And now, you know, she calls me all the time, like, oh, man, did you watch the Food Network? You watch the cooking channel? Like, <laughs> oh, my God, I just saw you on the cooking channel, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and then, but then she, like, passes down the recipes. She'll email me recipes that she found online and things like that. But it's, it's changed her completely. And, I, and like I said, it's not necessarily bad or worse or good or anything like that, but I can't get the dishes that she used to make now. It's, too, it's so. what it is, is it's prescient. We're, we're entering into like the first generation of parents that will like send kids their links to their favorite Epicurious recipes yeah. or yeah. something from Gourmet. And in some ways it's good because you get the recipe, but it's like what Wynn said, it, it's changed a lot. Yeah, my mom is constantly on Pinterest, constantly. <laughs> She's pretty advanced. Yeah. She's oh yeah, yeah. She like you know she goes on diets, so she'll be like, oh, I'm in this diet, and I looked at this beautiful salad on Pinterest. Look, and she'll just like she'll click on it and she'll see what it has. Just my mom just she just she'll look at it, she'll look at the ingredients, and then she'll make it her own. Like she'll like, but I added this and that, and like look, look what I made. But she yeah, she's obsessed with Pinterest. Kind of a humble brag. <laughs> um, Terry, I'm curious about you. You have a lot of really rich traditions in your family. Does that show up at NEMs a lot? It does. It shows up more with the baking than with the uh, like the savory food. We do like the breakfast and lunch food. The breakfast and lunch food comes more from. Um, I used to be in an all-girl punk rock band, and we toured the country like a thousand times, and. A lot of those recipes, like the biscuits and gravy and the grits with spicy sausage and cheddar, that stuff came, but was inspired by places that we were in America on tour. And um, it was, it, we were all foodies in, in, in our band, which was hilarious because we'd be on tour. And, you know, it's like supposed to be these tough, like, punk rock chicks, but we're in the van, like, reading, like, Bon Appetit and Gourmet and <laughs> And you have, like, the Martha $50 that you books. made at the show the night before. And yeah. you're like, well, we could spend it on gas, or we could go <laughs> to this great diner I heard about on the way yeah, over. Yeah, exactly. We do. It was always, and this is, like, you know, before, like, Yelp and Googling and stuff and all that. So, you know, you'd always ask the locals at the clubs, like, so what's the best oyster place here in Baltimore? Like, where can we get really good crab? And, you know, they'd always, obviously, you know, they live there, so they have the best places. And I was like, oh, there's this place on the corner, like the Crab Shack. And sure enough, it's like the best crab cakes we'd ever had. And they served them to you. It's literally a shack. And they serve them to you and put them on a brown piece of paper and kind of just roll it up on top and hand it to you. And that was like it. But it was like the best crab cake we ever had. So uh, most of the recipes and dishes that we do at Auntie M's are inspired by that and are also inspired by uh, what's in season, what's at the farmer's market, stuff like that. But I always drag my mom with me to the farmer's markets. That's fine. What about um, what about the sweet stuff that's over there? Is there any recipe that like you had s specifically from your parents that you can get over there? Um, uh, we do the apple strudel. Um, we do. I uh, when I'm doing the specials and stuff, like I'll do the chicken soup with my mom's crepes in it. 
Um, so yeah, a lot of that. I'm there. I'll, I'm let, there. You, I'll let you know. <laughs> There's this. Um, I watch Anthony Bourdain a lot, and mm -hmm. one of the things that he ends up saying almost anywhere he goes is he'll talk to a local and he'll get in this conversation. He'll go to like the best place to get this one dish and it'll be good, but it will never be as good as like the, the person who's touring them around as their parent would make it. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, well, these are professional cooks and you know, you, your mom wasn't a professional cook. How, how could they be that good? But it's almost a universal truth. And I'm wondering if you guys think that's true. Is really the parent the best cook on earth for you guys? And why is that? Like, I guess a bigger picture question. I think it's because of, of, of food memories, of comfort food memories. So with, 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 with anybody, it's like, oh, my mom makes it. You know, she's cooking the exact same recipe. And she's like, oh, my mom makes it better. It's the exact same recipe, but it's better from her mom because that's her food memory as a child of her mom making it and the smells and the comfort that she felt in the kitchen when she was a child. So I think it's I think it's like a food memory type thing. I think it's a little bit of that. I think it's also like kids get to get pretty custom food sometimes. Like I, when I, that piece I played earlier, um, when I was talking to Wendy Lee, our business reporter, she, one of the things she said to me during that interview was she was a picky eater. She didn't like vegetables and when she got lumpia, her mom would make special vegetable-free egg rolls just for her. There's not a lot of restaurants where you could order lumpia and like say, no, 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 just pork, please. I don't want anything else in it. Um, well, my mom, she um, she's a very modest baker. You, you do make the best baked goods ever. He can attest to that. <laughs> but, they're okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're really, really good, really but good. every time I try to make them, she's like, Jen, this is the exact same recipe. I'm like, no, mom, you did some sort of magic in here. You sprinkled <laughs> some powder, and it's amazing. But you, but also, she's, she's, she never admits that. She's like, oh, yeah, it's okay. It came out okay. And the rest of the family's like, oh, my God, this is the best thing ever. But then you have my grandma, who's not. She, she will be at a restaurant, and I'll be like, wow, grandma, try this fried rice. It's really good. She'll be like, mine is better. <laughs> she'll flat out say mine is better. Did she even try it? Oh yeah, she'll try it, but she'll take one bite and be like, "Mine is better." So I don't just like. Does your mom? I know. Does your mom say she's a good cook or is My she? My mom is not very modest. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she owns it. I mean, I'm telling you guys. My mom really is like the best cook ever. So she should be like. Oh, she especially when we go to other Mexican restaurants. We I don't take her to Mexican restaurants just because, you know, the entire meal she'll just be like, oh, mm, oh. Mm, really? <laughs> Will she send it back? No, no, she won't send it back. But she, it's her face. She and she has a very like she's got that face where you can just see her expressions. So you know she'll be like, oh, mm, they're they're serving this here. You know, oh, she, she'll. So, and, but it's great for us because it keeps us on our toes at the restaurant. You know, like when when mom's in town, like we have to be on our A game and make sure everything tastes perfectly, because then you know we get. We can say ass out, we get our ass hands, like, you know, she really gives it to us. So um, she's just, she just has like an incredible, like, you know, sense of taste. So she is able to see like what's the, you know, what the amount of salt, everything. But, you know, she, she, she can really, you know, she says her stuff is better. <laughs> She, she's parents. like your grandma. And I wonder if, you know, we say about memories, if when I have children, um, if they'll say grandma's is better, even though they never saw my mom cook, you know, if it would just be because when they grow up, they'll just, my mom will maybe feed it into their brain, like, you know, my mine is better than your mom's. You'll never live it down. <laughs> when have your parents tried your cooking? What, what has their reaction been? Yeah, well, here's the thing. Like, I, I guess they're like Mexican parents because like Vietnamese parents and Cantonese parents, they, well, so your mom sounds nice because Vietnamese and Cantonese people, they will outright say, this is horrible. I can make this better. And by the way, they're eating it all, by the way. They're eating it all. They're like, why am I paying for this? This is too expensive. I could totally make this at home. And all that. So uh, yeah, they, they do critique it. Really it. Like your parents are paying for it? Yeah. Yeah, well, they're not our food, but like, when, when, like yeah, but like our food, they, they're really nice and very positive because they understand, they, they weigh the, well, I could critique it, but I, I see how hard my son is working. And they, 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 they're nice to me. But when we go out to eat, they, there's, it's no holds barred. I mean, it's, they will go after people and, you know, it, 
Yeah, it, it's brutal. But you know, it, but here's the thing, though. Like as a restaurateur, this is what I'll tell you what I think my you know response to your question is too. Because whenever people come in, so now I've told you a lot of the dishes that we make actually are traditional dishes in different Asian cultures. Yeah. People always come in and say, "Oh my God, you know, this is really good, but my mom's is better." And we always say, "Look, you're right," because there's different memories. It's like you're saying, but it's it's. You know, I always say that food is. As much of a social media whore, can I say that, uh, as, I, as I am, I love social media. I consider food the original social media. You, you make up over food, you break up over food, you make love over food, you, you, know, you break bread over food, you do everything over food, and it's those memories that you associate with it. And sometimes you can change it too, because like, you know, I am Asian, so I, you know, and I'm Southeast Asian, I love durian, but it took me five years to actually love it. Like most people that eat durian, the smell of it alone is so overpowering that you can't even get to the food. But when you finally try it, it's still pretty strong. But if you try it enough, the smell starts reversing. And like now, when I smell durian, everyone in the room is like, "Oh my god, I can't stand it." I'm like, "Ah, so good. <laughs> I want some durian now." But you know, but, but that's what it is. I think it's association. It's not always how it tastes, but it's the it's the events that happen and transpire when you know it could have been the one time you had your mom's grilled cheese sandwich. It could have been a sunny day and something happened and. You know, all, this, all these events happen, and you can, you'll never really be able to articulate why that, you know, your mom's was the best at that point in time, it'll never be better, but it was, and you know that. My mom made me grilled cheese sandwiches, especially when I was sick, and that was a big thing for me. And still, like, whenever I have a cold or something, I will, if I'm not too sick, I will make a grilled cheese sandwich and uh, top ramen as well, which, I had a vegan friend, like, have an intervention with me once about top ramen. <laughs> He was like, what you were eating is poison. Stop eating this. And I was like, it's, it's good. I only, it's 10 cents a bag. And <laughs> like, I, I have it only once or twice when I'm sick. And it's still like, I, I, it's perfect for me. It's everything I need in one like, little package. And then the grilled cheese comes there with it. Um, I, I think you're right. It's a lot about comfort food. Um, Terry, have your parents tried your restaurant? Yeah, they come there all the time. Oh, my, they're actually coming for Mother's Day. Do you charge your parents like Wynn does? <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, no, I don't charge and my parents. You will pay double. No, I don't, of course not. This guy over here charges his parents. Oh. Uh, but yeah, they, like my dad, um, you know, grew up here and he's like total biscuits and gravy guy and just like American comfort food to the to the max, you know, it's like, Dad, but we have this beautiful spring scramble, you know, with these beautiful vegetables and stuff from the farmer's so He's like, ah, give me the biscuits and gravy with the sausage. <laughs> it's, that's his comfort food. Yeah, my dad's kind of a picky eater, too. I think I made, like, I had him over once for dinner, and I made a lasagna, and it, it took forever. It was like an artichoke lasagna. It, I, oh. I really liked making it. And I don't know why, but he doesn't like lasagna of any kind. <laughs> and he just kind of picked at it a little bit. And I was like, oh, man. By the way, my grandmother uh, on my uh, father's side made tomato aspic. Aspic is something that I think is going to come back within the next like, yeah, 10 years. Yeah, I think, I think it's going to be the trending. And she, if, if, if for any of you that don't know what aspic is, a tomato aspic, it's like a, it's like a tomato jello. Right, savory tomato jello with pieces of celery in it, and you serve it with a side of mayonnaise. <laughs> That's not coming so. back ever. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> so I saw it all over there. It's never here, and it's not coming back. It's this so is like wrong. with a mayo and it's foam. Not gluten -free. Oh my god, it's, it's so good. It's so ridiculously good. Yeah. Dominic and Jen, have you guys ever cooked for your parents? What's the response like usually? Yes, we have, we have cooked. Dom and I do some illegal pop-up dinners ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> we, have, we have illegally cooked for our parents and yes. legally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they've signed consent forms. <laughs> no one's gotten sick. <laughs> so a pop-up okay. pop dinner at your house for your parents. Right. Yeah. Well, yes. I, I mean, I, I'm getting into it because, because of social media, because I post everything I make now and I take pictures of it, they're jealous and they want me to cook for them. Um, so I've been starting to cook a little bit more uh, for them. And the, re the reaction is always really good because it's stuff that, being in LA, we're exposed to so much. And we can have cuisine from all over, like from 
you know, Bricia's family to Wynn's, Wynn's family. Like, and those are flavors that I never grew up with and that I don't think my parents are familiar with. So because that's the kind of stuff I cook is, you know, more ethnic, traditionally ethnic cuisines, um, it's kind of cool to introduce them to like a lifestyle that, that as Angelinos we were familiar with, but they might not be familiar with. So um, it's always fun. Like they, they like it probably because they don't even know um, that other people are doing it better. <laughs> <laughs> that could be true. Yes. Yeah. Um, we have a little bit of time left. I think we should go into, uh, you guys obviously have other lives other than just talking on the stage. Um, talk about what you do. What are you working on lately? What, what are you doing right now that you're excited about? Uh, well, first I was focusing for work. We just uh, did a big relaunch of our website at latimes.com, so we were working on that for a long time. Which okay. looks super good. Yeah, it looks really good. Thank you. Pretty, pretty. Thanks, guys. <laughs> yeah, uh, and then um, myself, I'm, I'm working on a, a book, actually, on um, the food scene in LA. So that's taking up most of my time right now. Cool. Awesome. Dominic? Um, for me, I'm, star I, um, I'm working with three new restaurants. Um, Superba, I'll just, I guess I should plug them. Superba Snack Bar in Venice, Superba Food and Bread in Venice, and Eastboro in Culver City, which is Vietnamese food. Um, I'm working with their branding and their, their, digital, um, their, their digital voice. And so that's really keeping me busy, and it's really fun, and, um, and the restaurants are really great. So it's, it's now I'm kind of learning what it's like behind the scenes at restaurants and developing a voice as someone who loves food, but trying to convey that to, to other people. And also, um, really quickly, I do want to plug, I'm a chair, per, or excuse me, a committee member for Taste of the Nation LA, and it's a food, uh, like a food and beverage event, which happen, is happening on June 1st in Culver City. You can purchase your tickets at nokidhungry.com. And it's, um, there'll be about 40 restaurants, there'll be uh, beverages, beer, alcohol, all of that, and it's just a food festival. Anybody can come and try different bites from all over, all over Los Angeles. It's one of the best food festivals in LA. And it's um, full charity, so all, all profits do go to um, share our strength and no kid hungry. Terry? I love it. Um, I just finished a cookbook, if I Fancy. can get it. Ooh. Boom. <laughs> um, it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my whole life. And it took a year of, uh, you know, just sitting with every spare moment I had writing these recipes and all of this stuff. But it's also sort of a story of the band I was in and being on a tour and how, you know, everything and uh, how everywhere we went influenced the recipes and stuff. So it's all the Antium's uh, recipes, um, including the red velvet cupcake. Yes. <laughs> that one's like you're giving Boom. that recipe away. I'm like, they'll still come in. Don't worry. <laughs> when? I'm not exactly sure how to answer that because <laughs> I don't, in the history of Star Kitchen, we've moved twice. Yeah, you've been to a ton of different places. We've been to a lot of different places. We started at my apartment, then we opened Lunch Place, then we closed it, opened the Fashion District, then we moved to Chinatown. We're currently in Chinatown right now. We also have a, a banh mi shop. We do a pop-up every um, Friday, 11 to 2 p.m. Um, part of the answer is trying to not lose my shirt. That's what I'm trying not to do. <laughs> It, no, that, it's like, hard. It, it actually is. You no, know, seriously. It, as, as much as I joke around about it, like I, I'd love to. I mean, that's a whole other conversation. But running a restaurant is really difficult. Um, but, and we've been doing it for five years, and I have no idea how we're still alive. But um, I want to do a fried rice fest one day. I don't know, like maybe do it with like fancy meats and stuff, and just do a lot of fried rice. That's one thing. Bacon. Um, yeah, bacon. Yeah, bacon, <laughs> bacon. Yeah, <laughs> bacon, pastrami, chorizo. Like I'm yeah. not even kidding. Like I fried egg on amazing. top. Yeah, now, now I'm just, I just spilled all the beans. Okay, I have something. I have something planned. I got that. I have to... You can put beans well, on the fried rice. Yeah, beans, beans and fried rice is good. You ever had... Like, it's like Colombian... Um, they actually... They do a fried rice with beans. It's actually really... With black beans, it's really good. Wow. Don't joke around about that, man. Um, I'm also... like, What is this? I get, I'm helping with the Save Music in Chinatown, which is on Sunday, May 18th, 3 p.m. Um, come check that out. Trying to improve music and uh, education in Chinatown. I don't know. We've got a lot of food festivals this, this Tell year. Tell exactly where your restaurant is. We are inside the Grand Star Jazz Club in Central Plaza in Chinatown. There is no signage for Star Kitchen anywhere. <laughs> you have to know we're inside there. And it is a dive bar, so don't be scared. There's good food in there. And uh, we're right next to the Bruce Lee, the only Bruce Lee statue in all North America, and across from the original Madame Wong's, which was the home of punk rock in yeah. all of America or the world. So visit his Precia? restaurant there. It's really good. 
Okay. Uh, well, let's see. What month? Um, <laughs> I did say I love mole dot com, and I, I know you guys were talking mole. about um, getting my mom's recipe. Uh, we do actually do sell our mole paste online, so you can just go I love mole dot com or store dot I love mole dot com, and where you can get. Um, we sell our black, our red, and our colorito, which are the three um, hardest things, hardest moles to make. Uh, you can make it in 15 minutes and tell your husband or boyfriend or wife or significant other that you spent two days in the kitchen. And I promise you, I've done it, it works. Um, and it tastes like my mom's. Uh, you can get those, so we have our online store that keeps us very busy. Uh, we are also launching, we just launched our, um, uh, we have a michelada mix. Um, that you basically, it's, um, if anybody knows what a michelada is, basically like a spicy beer cocktail. So um, you dump it in your beer and voila, you have a michelada. And you can find it um, soon at Northgate Markets. And we're doing a michelada truck coming your way this summer. Um, come to the World Cup. And we are um, at the restaurant. And we are also uh, celebrating our 20th year anniversary this August. And we'll have a month long celebration. Congrats. With nice. a lot of mezcal, a lot of mole, a lot of friends from Oaxaca visiting. Um, and our michelada truck. Um, you can also visit our michelada website, ilovemicheladas.com. Um, what don't you love, Bricia? Uh, I, <laughs> true, true. Um, and then you can visit my blog, briselopers.com, where I post a lot of recipes um, and just keep you guys updated on everything that's going on in Oaxaca. Um, and visit Oaxaca and follow our hashtag, Live Oaxaca. <laughs> I right, know. So, uh, we'll open up <laughs> questions to you guys right now. Just uh, wait for the microphone to come to you. Raise your hands if you have any questions for our panelists. Oh, hi. My name is Beatty, and uh, I have a question for Mr. Nguyen. Um, when? Um, I was it's wondering you. how did you become uh, adventurous with your food? And what motivated you to eat Dorian? Because I have a little Asian nephew, and he loves hamburgers and hot dogs, as, like you. And <laughs> trying to get him to eat you know, sushi and chow mein and all that good stuff. Um, it, it took a lot of time, let's say that. Like, part of it was reconnecting with my culture. Um, you know, I, I'm ultimately inherently American. I can tell you right now, I have a sweet tooth, which most Asian people don't have. Um, I love me some fried chicken, chicken fried steak. Well, actually, Asians love fried chicken, too, but that's a different story. <laughs> but part of it was when I, um, I took a trip back to Vietnam when I was 18, and that really changed everything. It, like, you know, I, I, I was born in America, and I grew up in America. And my parents had instilled in me, you know, speak Vietnamese at home, you know, all these different Vietnamese traditions. And it never really connected with me until I went home to Vietnam. And I was like, holy crap. Like, this is all this stuff that you guys have been just mouthing off about. This is, this is the reason why. And, you know, when I was in Vietnam, too, like, when you, when you travel, you almost have no choice but to eat the food there. You can try to go to McDonald's. And I, I know there's options like that. But when you immerse yourself, and travel is the other part of that. Like, it's not just going back to my own culture. But that changed everything. And it opened my perspective a little bit. And you know, then I was starting to wonder. Then my curiosity started growing. And then I started realizing, you know what? I, I'm, I'm too picky for my own good. And my parents have been telling this to me all my life. And I, I had to come around to it myself. And with durian, that was really strange. Because like my entire family, you know, and every Vietnamese person that I, I knew would make fun of me for not liking durian. And, it's funny because Vietnamese people, unlike some, like Japanese people are really nice to other like people that are trying to learn Japanese. Vietnamese people are very mean, and 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 uh, it made me insecure. I'm not so insecure now, but eventually I just started trying it enough that I started liking it and I started seeing um, why people like it. And you know, it could, what also changes is having different quality products. Because I'm sure when I was a kid that wasn't very good, and I started trying fresh durian, and I'm like, oh, this is pretty good, but it takes time. It, it forcing it doesn't, it just doesn't, it just doesn't work. But like, repetition helped a lot. So, anyone else? Hello, my name is Terry. I had a question for Bricia Lopez. 
I believe I read somewhere that Galagetza also serves chapulinas. Is that correct, or yes, am I mistaken? Grasshoppers. Yes, we oh, do. Okay. Is that on your menu on a regular basis? Yes, it's on our menu on every day. Um, oh. And it's one of the things that I grew up with, and I always find it. I mean, it's one of these things that you know people come and they want to try, or they're like, "Oh, eat one in front of me. Let me see, really." And I'm like. I've been eating these since I was like three, dude. Like it's like no big deal, um, and I don't think it's weird. But you know, I could see why people would think eating a grasshopper would be odd. But yes, to, we have them on our menu. And is there delicious. like a is like a pitch you give to people if they're thinking about ordering and they're not totally sure? Oh, I, I think it's great to order. I mean, you know, I always bring them out and people are like try it. Really, like look at me, like it's totally <laughs> safe. Like I'm not dead. You know, it's like it's good. You, I mean, they're seasonal too. Like some. I uh, during rainy season we get the smaller ones and when it's not we get the bigger ones and the bigger ones are it's hard for people to eat because you can actually like you know see the legs and they might get stuck in your teeth. Uh, <laughs> You're not selling not it very pitch. well yeah. right now. Yeah. I know, I know. Why are people walking out? What's going <laughs> yeah, on? Everyone's leaving. <laughs> but um, but they're you know um, they're very salty, um, so I always um, you know encourage people to use them as a garnish and. Um, like in a taco, we sprinkle them in there with beans. They're amazing. Um, honestly, we sometimes when I eat in my restaurant every single day, every I eat my food every day, um, and sometimes like I'll just sit down and have like a pizza tortilla and grasshoppers and cheese, and that's all I'll eat. You know, um, so it, it's they're they're really good. Give them a how try. are they, how are they prepared? What is what's what I would just saute them with you know a little olive oil and lime and salt, and that's it. They're dead when they get here. So we don't. <laughs> Does that help or hurt? I'm not sure. Uh, we have a question from someone up front. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Bill. Well, first of all, we enjoyed all your chit chat. <laughs> One thing, um, when I was a boy, I ate a lot of tripe. Did you ever hear of it? Yeah. Okay. Well, my mother really knew how to cook that stuff. This is for real. <laughs> I enjoyed it even as a child. <clears throat> of course, my wife, when she saw it, she almost, you know what. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but I've been, I've, I, in Europe, I, I find it and uh, very enjoyable. My friends in Italy, you can, you can order uh, just a big bowl of it, and that's it. But the thing is, what I find is, <clears throat> when I go to your restaurants, most of them, to find the tripe, the stuff smells. And uh, I asked people about that, and they don't know what you're talking about. And yet, when I say, does this smell? Oh, no, this doesn't smell. And some tripe is very, very tasty. You know, these people know how to make it. But very few restaurants can put it out where it's really a delicious dinner. And uh, what experience have you people had with that? And who knows how to make it here? Brisia, I bet. No, her mom. Her mom. Stage is yours. <laughs> Menudo. Well, Menudo. Um, we, do, we don't sell tripe in my restaurant, um, but tripe is very popular in Mexico, especially in tacos. So I would just recommend that you just scout out taco trucks, like Mexican taco trucks, and just say tripa, and they'll just, that's it. You'll have amazing tripe in front of you. It's and usually fried. I'll second that tortilla. because my girlfriend, that's her go-to taco filling. And green sauce. <laughs> tripe goes great with green sauce. Don't put red sauce. Make sure you get the green sauce on top of the tripe. I am so hungry right now. Is there, a uh, is there a specific truck or restaurant that makes a really good like taco de tripa? Uh, let's see. I, again, restaurants. I, I, you're right. I don't. You're right. I just realized there aren't Carts. a lot of restaurants that do yeah. tripe at restaurants. But um, you know, any great like taco truck will have tripa on the menu. Um, so, just scout out a Mexican. You know, like a like like a like not a fancy taco truck. Just like um, you know, white with a. Like. Oh, just hold on one sec. Hold on. Oh. They always give you. They always well. They give you a little taste of it in a, in a little uh, cup. But sometimes people give you a good swat of it. You know, <laughs> as a taste. Fortunately, when they do a swat of it, don't don't. <laughs> I wouldn't even try to get rid of it. don't need it anymore. <laughs> I, I have an answer for the tribe though too. Well, do you want like a whole like like serving of it, or do you? Like, it's funny, like, have you ever had Vietnamese pho? pho? Like, tripe is actually an ingredient in pho. Yeah. I, and to probably possibly answer your question, and we don't make tripe, but I make it at home sometimes, parts of preparation, a lot of those 
prepping, like it's cleaning it and things. Like it, that makes a huge difference. And I'm not trying to out anyone in the restaurant business, but you'd be surprised how much preparation doesn't go into, like you know, cleaning like just your vegetables and some of your ingredients because it takes a lot longer, but it it, it it tastes a whole lot better. And on top of that, you know, braising things it also takes a long time. And I think you're probably the trap. You're it's probably really tender and really tasty and clean. And that needs to be braised for a couple hours to be able to get that texture. And some places just won't do that. They'll just kind of make it hot and serve it to you. So I wish I had that for you. Anyone else? Uh, My mom has a question. (laughs) Hi, my name is Susan. Do you have any memories of epic fails? That your parents did every single day. Oh no, my mother! Parents. My mother once made a mistake and put <laughs> cinnamon in her lasagna. Yeah. What, what did she think it was? She just what you grabbed the wrong. For? Thought it was paprika or, or chili powder or something. My mother-in-law uh, apparently once made an infamous pie where she switched salt for sugar. <laughs> yes, she did. But the well, gray bricks, those I weren't epic like, fails. I think the epic fail was mostly like coming from. Us kids, rather, I'm telling you, I know, I keep saying, my mom really can't do no wrong, so I never remember her doing her any, like, fail, but I, I know, I'm just, I'm serious, she's not even here, she's, you know, I just, but I remember my brother and I, my grandma was taking care of us, and then, um, we thought we would be adventurous, and we wanted to make something for her, so we decided to make her an apple smoothie. I don't know, if, <laughs> I don't, honestly, I, I know, I don't know why we thought, but we cut up we cut up the apples and we put um, just apples and milk in a blender. Apparently, they don't really go well together. And, um, and we would try and it was disgusting. So we just kept putting sugar and kept just kept putting sugar and kept just kept putting sugar. Uh, and like my grandma came into the kitchen and she was like, what are you guys doing? You're like, well, grandma, we're trying to make you a smoothie. Uh, and my grandma, <clears throat> rest her soul, you know, she had diabetes. And um, she, so she tasted it, and she was like, oh, this is horrible. And she just like down it, but we just didn't understand until later we realized the only reason she was drinking it was just because it was sugar, you know? Uh, but she had it, and she was like, oh, this is disgusting. And she was just drinking, and you know, she finished the entire thing. But I think that was like, to me, that's like the epic fail that comes to mind when it comes to being in the kitchen. We were, I was probably like, probably like eight, and my brother was like five. And we made that apple. By the way, can I give your mom credit for using the term epic fail? <laughs> that is incredibly relevant. I mean, sir, I just thought about that. Did you, you use the term, like, did you hashtag that? Epic <laughs> fail? My, my mom oh, fair Twitter. enough. Don't worry. You're, you're, you're on the right track still. So. She, she has a Twitter and she has a Facebook. She's, she's a pretty connected mom. Uh, I guess, are there any other questions or should we go into more bad food? Question and that is Terry, do you uh, make those crepes at your restaurant with the lemon? Um, I'm the I make them at home. The ones that I do at the restaurant, um, I'll do as a special. Sometimes in 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 a chicken uh, soup, like a homemade chicken soup, but I mostly do them at my rest uh, at my house for breakfast. They're you cook so at good. home. The recipe is on. Yeah, that's the recipe that, no, it's not in the cookbook. But you cook at home. You cook at home. Right. Yeah, that's but it's the recipe that's on the website, right? Cool. You can, yeah, check that oh, out at kpcc.org. And if you click the forum page, yeah. it'll take So the recipe is up there for you guys. And yeah. And my second question was, is there a difference between black and brown mole? Or is it the same? I've never heard of brown mole. I've always heard of it as brown mole. I didn't realize it was black oh. mole. So. Oh. Hmm? Oh, um, well, there's mole what, what, from what Oaxaca, which is like the best, and then there's a the second best, which is from Puebla. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you ask somebody from Puebla. Um, and theirs tends to be a little bit lighter and also not as good as ours. Um, so we, we stick here. it to the black. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got it from my mom. All right, we have time for one more question. Hi, my name is Margaret. Oh, that was loud. <laughs> no, you sound good. You sounded nice. Um, yes, I would like to know what advice would each of the panelists give an individual who wants to begin to play with food and, and recipes and things like that? Begin to what? Play with it? Play with food. Yeah, play with you food. Experiment. I mean, could I start? Because I started cooking on my own. Yes. Uh, look up recipes on the internet. 
and don't freak out if you don't have every single ingredient for it. And then just kind of mess around with it. And like, if you know, if something calls for like white wine vinegar and all you have is rice vinegar, don't flip out and go to the grocery store. Use that. And I think that's kind of a good gateway drug into like making up your own recipes once you know what you can play with. And if you screw up once, you screw up once. It probably won't taste that bad. What about yeah. Jen? Uh, I grew up watching uh, the Food Network a lot, a lot of Rachel Ray. So I know to use a garbage bowl and what EVOO is. <laughs> but um, No, but I, I watch the Food Network a lot. I, I TiVo stuff on the Food Network. Um, and that it's OK if you make it and it's bad. Just have low expectations. But yeah. Uh, my advice is to, to be curious, um, to try to be curious and try things that maybe aren't familiar, but also to try to go out and eat. I mean, I eat out a lot, and and that's kind of where I get my inspiration is from eating out somewhere and then trying to figure out how I can make that at home because you can't always go out and, and have that dish over and over. So if, you, if you're starting to cook, you, you, you should start with making stuff you like because then you can you can figure out how to make it better or how to make it into you know what it really should be. I think if you're if you're just cooking just to just to eat, I, I think you don't you don't you don't become as adventurous. So I think you have to be curious, adventurous, and and um, and go after what you like, and then perfect that, and then you can start trying trying other things. I recommend you buy Terry's book and give that a try. <laughs> nice. That was a good plug. <laughs> That's good. It's good. Bring it around. I, I'm a big proponent of, of cookbooks. I have like 200 cookbooks at home. And um, I think you like go to a bookstore and kind of just, you know, sort of look through the cookbooks and stuff and something that piques your interest and start cooking the recipes out of it. I think females um, are a lot better about cooking out of cookbooks than guys are. Guys are just like, ah. You know, I'm going to do my thing. In general, I'm not going like to look at a recipe. That's the sound I make all the time. But, <laughs> <laughs> and I generally say I just I'm do just, my thing. So. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I, I, um, yeah, I love cookbooks and recipes and stuff. Or on the internet, you know, just look stuff, stuff up that you like. Like if it's a chicken piccata, look that up and, 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 and follow it. And Especially cookbooks now, the, the, the photos are so amazing in cookbooks nowadays. Yeah. Like, I, I, I can just look at a cookbook in a store and get hungry looking at what's in, like, just, you know, just a, one fish. And it's like, how do they make that fish look like something? I just want to eat the fish. It's not even cooked. <laughs> I, I wouldn't say to try to do that, though, because don't, those pictures will really let you down. Yeah, no, they always, they always do, but I end up buying yeah, a cookbook cook, and they get my money anyway. Photography is like a whole thing. Yeah, food porn. That is amazing. just amazing, that, uh, uh, which I just learned when we were doing the cookbook. It's like, takes, you know, like half a day to shoot one shot, like a, a stack of pancakes. It takes half a day. You know, people, they're using tweezers and blow dryers and, you know, it's just like, what are you Talking doing? Talking dirty to it. It's yeah. amazing. It's, uh, it's crazy. <laughs> sorry, I had to. Uh, I, I have a different piece of advice. It depends on what kind of person you are. If you're incredibly cerebral, um, that changes a lot. Like, if you need recipes, I would start baking. If you yeah. don't need, because baking is very precise. Yeah. Um, making, like, cooking there, there's a lot of things they can't teach you that you have to learn on your own that they won't be able to articulate even in a book because if you're too cerebral, you'll overthink it, you'll overcook it, and you will, you'll miss the point of the certain things that you're throwing in. If you're the kind of person that you throw you know, uh, caution to the wind, then totally cook, but then on that note, taste everything, which is honestly the number one rule in any kitchen, which doesn't always get applied all the time, like, you know, my wife will always yell at my cooks. They're like, did you taste this? And they'll be like, uh, uh. Like, why didn't you taste this? You cooked it. You should taste it. Because if you're making savories and you're cooking, the thing that you should know, too, if you're not as cerebral, is that it can be fixed, too. Or it can be adjusted. Or you might stumble upon something that you never thought about. Um, like, applying heat at different times or a different temperature will change everything. Like, there are so many different variables when you're actually cooking and searing and sauteing, or you know, whether it be sous-viding, you know, whatever it is, 
Like there's that it can it can blow your mind how one little thing can change the entire outcome of food. You know, and food's not just flavor; it's texture, it's balance, it's sweet and savory and bitter and, and everything in between. So, um, if that's too much for you, then go bake. <laughs> <laughs> Baking's harder. No, bake, baking is more difficult. But if you're if you're the kind of person that likes to follow instructions, you 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 get more fulfillment out of it, though. Yeah. I'm terrified by baking. Like I I. I made like three or four things my whole life. Cooking with like a savory thing, yeah, you can make adjustments as you go along, which is, I don't know, it gives me a little more confidence that I can't like totally ruin something. It's more tangible too, because you can get a feel for it. When you bake, once it's in the oven or something similar, you just wait. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the fear. <laughs> Sorry, that's, Sorry no, no, that's no. why I hire good bakers at my restaurant. I don't touch it. Uh, but your bake stuff is good. Don't worry about it, girl. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not making it. They are. <laughs> Uh, Brice, do you have any advice for getting into cooking? Buy Terry's book, man. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, um, I think that's about it. I want to thank uh, all the panelists for coming and talking and sharing all those stories. We're all pretty hungry now, even though I ate beforehand. Um, I want to thank you guys for coming out. Uh, give the panelists a big round of applause. Give yourselves a round of applause. All right, uh, thanks again for coming. I guess that wraps it up. Thank you. Drive safe, Thanks, you guys. everyone. <laughs>